Welcome to the Kingsbury's Documentary Project Show. Today we are talking about the second industrial revolution and how the nation changed as we transitioned towards technology. The nation was full of changes starting in around the mid-1870s. These changes were mostly technological as they included the invention of the telephone, cars, and most famously, the light bulb. The first transcontinental railroad was completed in the middle of the Civil War. Now, instead of transporting soldiers and supplies to the battlefield, it was used to transport goods to the settlers who migrated west. The railroad system helped department stores such as Sears, Roebuck and & Company, and Montgomery Ward expand out west, mainly through the mail order houses and the many post offices that opened up around the tracks. Mail order houses were houses where people ordered goods through the many catalogs that the department stores provided. That meant that they could still get fashionable clothing without having to take a big trip into the city. 1876 was the big year for the United States. Not only did Alexander Graham Bell patent the telephone, but Thomas Edison also created the first light bulb, which burnt for 11 hours straight. By 1882, Edison had created the Edison Electric Light Company, whose purpose was to bring electricity to the common people. And this is where our show starts tonight. Please welcome Savannah, who will be interviewing our very special guest, Mr. Thomas Edison. Now, I know you created a business called the Edison Electric Light Company. When did this start? Well, I created it in 1882. Oh, really? My original plan was to run electricity through New York City's financial district, but then that quickly expanded to other places like St. Paul. Did you face any hardships in starting your company? Oh, of course. Every business does. I had a lot of trouble getting uh, permission from the cities to run wires and other material needed to bring electricity to these cities. How does this relate to St. Paul? I had to take responsibility for anything that might go wrong. I had to pay for it all and then offer to pay for it again in case anything would have to be rebuilt. And on top of that, they did not even want to run the plants. Clearly it all paid off. Yeah, it did. Now back to our host. And thank goodness it did. But one thing the company needed to mass produce goods was steam. And in order to get steam, they needed coal. They specifically needed anthracite coal. Anthracite coal is widely used after 1850 and was one of the main reasons why the second industrial revolution occurred. The first industry to use anthracite coal was the meat industry. In 1860, they created the first disassembly line. It mainly focused on cows and was able to disassemble a cow in less than five minutes. Soon, many other industries came on board and the second industrial revolution was created. Of course, there are many different ways to create a successful business during the second industrial revolution. And eventually, John P. Sherman of Ohio was forced to pass the Sherman Antitrust Act in response to those businesses. Between the years of 1898 and 1902, there were more than 2,600 firms that closed and went out of business. This is because of your act, correct? Yes, that is correct. You see, most of those businesses were monopolistic, which was going to destroy the market as we knew it. My act simply outlawed these monopolistic practices in order to maintain a healthy market. Okay, that makes sense. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in the business world, there are two types of growth, yes? Right again. Those two types are vertical and horizontal integration. Vertical integration is when a company tries to gain control of production through every step of the way. So something like car gain is steel production. Precisely. Next is horizontal integration, which is simply the opposite, being when a company tries to control of a single product. An example of this would be the Standard Oil Company founded by John D. Rockefeller in 1870. All they do is oil. Thank you, John. I'm sure I speak on many people's behalf when I say this all makes a lot more sense now. No problem. Glad to be of service. We now bring you a man who some say is the richest man in the world. Please welcome Andrew Carnegie. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for being with us today. Hi, Aaron. It's a pleasure. So how is it being the richest man in the world? Can you tell us all of how you came to be this way? Surely it wasn't just love. Let me begin with a man named Jay Gold, who owned the Erie Railroad. He was a dishonest man who gained a number of companies by pursuing and tricking them into his little schemes. One company actually had to threaten him to, with arrest to get their business back. Wow, that sounds like a cruel life to live. Yeah, it was a bit more honest, I'd say. I also went to work on the railroad more specifically the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was when I was working there that I had the idea on how to improve the steel industry. It was my way of mass producing steel that makes me the man I am today. That's incredible! I guess this really showcases the importance of honesty in a successful life. You wrote a book, didn't you? With a few of your morals? Indeed I did. The Gospel of Wealth. One of my favorite quotes, There is no genuine praiseworthy success in life if they are not honest, truthful, or fair, then. That's excellent! What great morals to live by! 
I can clearly see how you were so successful. The ideas of social Darwinism explain it perfectly, explaining how some Americans grow rich and how others grow poor. This idea can be clearly seen between you and gold. Thank you, I appreciate it. The idea of social Darwinism was clearly shown with the way that the immigrants are treated. Now we go to Augusto. Here we have with us is an immigrant who came to the U.S. in the 1800s during the period of the wave of immigrants. Welcome, Augusto. Why don't you begin by telling us some of your experiences? I still remember having to live in those crowded tenants with barely enough space for everyone to sleep in. In fact, I have a picture here with me today. Oh, how fascinating. Tell me, where did you work at the time? One. I was actually one of the workers that helped build the Brooklyn Bridge. On that note, I have a surprise for you. As I recall, this truly was a time of great architecture being made everywhere, especially in the big cities. In my opinion, the greatest invention was the railroads. They made mass per transportation easy. Oh yes, here's a picture showing the numerous amount of rail lines made back then. They played a big part in decreasing the distance between big cities. And the appearance of the cable cars made it easier for people like us to travel around the cities. Yeah, they did. I also thought it was interesting how cities started rebuilding buildings after they burned down. Oh yes, that started with the big Chicago fire. A cow started the fire, and people had no idea what to do and were trapped inside the buildings, which led the cities to plan such events. However, it did take them a time to find out and do something about the environmental impacts the city's growth was having on the cities. I remember all the sewage and all the garbage in the city slums, and then some men in white went around the town and cleaned it up. Can you tell us some more about the way the slums were organized? Of course there are buildings that are more than five stories tall, and the floors were 20 feet by 100 feet, and those were furthermore divided into crowded tenants. All right, well thank you for joining us today. The immigrants did have to overcome many challenges once coming to the United States, and once the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed, it made life even harder for the Chinese immigrants. Now we're gonna to cut to a Chinese immigrant who will be talking about his life here in the United States after he immigrated. So, how is it living in the United States after the Chinese Exclusion Act passed? Well, it's kind of challenging. I feel quite excluded because not many other Chinese people are living here today. How are you able to stay in the United States? Well, under the Section 3 in the Chinese Exclusion Act, it says you are allowed to stay in the country if you came on November 17, 1880. Such a specific day! I was actually recruited as a laborer to come to USA. My family was planning on following me here a few years later after I established myself here and was able to afford for them to come over, but cannot get into country today. So do you still talk to your family? We send that back and forth, but we don't really get to talk much other than that. That's hard. Well, thanks for talking to us today. You're welcome. Now on to a man who worked in the cigar making industry when the, all the union drama was happening. Well, hello. So which union are you a part of now? Well, I'm not with the Knights of Labor anymore. Actually, everyone I work with moved from the Knights of Labor. We all didn't like how our bosses were making decisions without thinking about how they impact us. So long story short, I now am part of the American Federal of Labor, AFL. So were you part of the Haymarket Square riot? Or was anyone you knew a part of it? No one that I know was a part of it. I know it was a pretty big event, and I am thankful none of the people I work with decided to go on strike that day for their eight hour long work days. A lot of people got hurt. I saw in an article from The Sun, the car carpet makers were also having problems with the Knights. Do you know anything about that? Oh yeah, some people who are in the AFL with me are carpet makers, but I don't think they were having as many problems as we did with the Knights. Well, thank you for talking with us today. Now back to you. Of course, our ancestors did a lot of work and had troubles with the unions, but they also found time to engage in leisurely activities. We will now cut to Albert Spaulding, a sports entre entrepreneur as well as an athlete. Mr. Spaulding, you've had quite a successful life. Where were you educated? Well, back in my days, we didn't have anywhere near, as, near of an education system as folks do nowadays. I just went to a small school in a small town close to where I lived. There was no educational association to prepare me for college, so all I had was a high school education. I know that the National Education Association has made the curriculum more difficult by adding in Latin, Greek, and ancient history. Did you have to take those in high school? I can speak English, so I can tell you that I took an English course, but I've never heard of those other humble jumble. 
You weren't there to feel the effects of the National Education Association on society, but I'm sure you were there for the Morrill Federal Land Grant Act of 1862, Vassar, and Tuskegee, right? Representative Justin Morrill of Vermont proposed the act. I know that, but what did it do? The Morrill Land Grant Act funded state colleges and universities to teach agriculture and mechanics. In other words, it aided agricultural colleges. Now that my memory is refreshed, let me take a crack at the other two. Vassar was the first women's college, wasn't it? Correct. It was founded in 1865 and set the academic standard for the remainder of the century. That must mean that Tuskegee is one of the first African-American colleges, right? Yep. Tuskegee was founded in 1881 by Booker R. Washington because he felt that blacks should strive for a more practical education so they would be better prepared for the work field. You can tell that Tuskegee was created before the National Education Association because of their differing opinions. Crazy how times have changed, right Mr. Spaulding? Before we know it, women are going to be allowed to play baseball alongside men. Well, you've been an influential figure in the baseball community. I'm sure that you could stop it from happening if you wanted. Of course I could. Did you know that my brother, J. Walter Spaulding, and I acquired the rights to produce the official National League Baseball and the rule book as well? I'm sure that I was the first to build parks that seated around 10,000, and I know it was, that it was thanks to my work that baseball practices have been tighter and more efficient. I wouldn't doubt it, Mr. Spaulding. Now, let's move on to more fun topics. Everyone knows that baseball is America's national pastime, but in addition to baseball, what do you like to fill in your free time? Hmm, have you been to New York Central Park? It opened in 1858 to the public for ice skating. It's quite fun, but make sure to bundle up if you go during the winter. Here I even brought a painting of what it's like. I can't say I have. I mostly stick to vaudeville palaces when I'm in New York, they provide the best variety of entertainment out there. There are singers, dancers, comedians, jugglers, and acrobats. I'm more of a sports type of guy. I prefer my parks over band channels. Maybe we can attend a game together. Certainly. Thanks for your time today, Mr. Spaulding. While some people seemingly had no problems, the South was undergoing a radical change after the Civil War. Now we come back to Carnegie, who will be talking about his work in the South. We are here today with one of the most successful people in America, Andrew Carnegie. I'd first like to start by asking, why did you consider the South as Pencil Pennsylvania's most formidable industrial enemy? Good question. It was the state of Alabama and areas around that specifically that really was attempting to jeopardize our industrial infrastructure. I had to take action. What did you do to render the heavy competition? I had to take some drastic measures, so I ordered the railroads to charge higher freight fees for shipments heading to Birmingham, Alabama. It wasn't too difficult to impose considering the North owned half of the rail in the South. So did these higher freight fees get the job done? It works somewhat. However, around the turn of the century, I decided to ultimately take matters into my own hands. So I bought up all the steel plants in the Birmingham area. So that means you essentially took over all the production of this valuable product? That's correct. It was quite a big job, I must say. So it seems the North is heavily influencing the South, is it not? The South relies on us for capital and administration. This was because of all the infrastructure being ran by us in the North. That's all I have for you. Thanks for your time, Mr. Carnegie. We now move on to a representative from the South who was responsible for the white-only workforce in the South. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start off by asking, how were the overall work conditions in the South? Well, to be honest, the work conditions were rather poor. The advances in the industry didn't really have an impact on the work um, conditions. I also hear that there's a lot of discrimination and segregation in the workplace. That is correct. In the workplace, it is a typical sight to see African Americans and white workers segregated. Was there a difference between the jobs these two groups did? Typically, all the white people operated all the fancy heavy machinery, while the African Americans usually had more of the janitorial tasks. Has there ever been any hiring of these minorities operating heavy machinery? There have been a few cases of that, and as a result, white labor unions went on strike because they were very protective of their higher-end jobs. How much did a typical worker make in the South? Wages in the South were really low, and even lower for minorities. I've also heard about the system of convict labor. How did this system work? This was a system in where crime committers were put in a separate workforce and where hard labor was inflicted on the convicts. There have also been cases of random African Americans being captured and put into the convict workforce for no reason whatsoever. What were some of these jobs this workforce did? Mostly public work tasks, which helped with regional progress. Well, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for your time. The South's goods created more jobs in the North. 
which quickly expanded into a new social class. Go. So tell us about the Piedmont communities and the changes occurring there. The Piedmont people were originally farmers, but through industrialization, they became textile workers. Some of this can be seen in the picture with a factory, and there are rows and rows of machines for people to work on, and it is very crowded. Oh, really? Also, there's an article that mentions the mill towns and how they grow in population, and there were poor wages. Then it goes on to discuss about how long these people might stay in these kinds of working conditions. Very interesting. Now tell us about this new upper class that arose during those times. Well, the upper class was uniting together, sending kids to the same school. Also, they were more like consumers and would measure up to their wealth and show it off. This can be seen in a newspaper where some of the headlines included oriental cotton fabrics, reliable furs, jackets, coats, capes, and more. This would be exactly what they were interested in. This goes along with the term conspicuous consumption, which is mostly all of the above things. Keep in mind that they did help out people around them, for they are leading patrons of the arts. Thanks, Mr. Revlin. Now on to our next guest, an engineer, who is part of the rising middle class. Can you tell us more about the rising middle class? Sure. I'm a corporate engineer for the U.S. Steel Company. I work long hours, but this ensures that my family can have a lot of better things, like fancy appliances, elaborate home decorations, and a lot of extra leisure time. Can you tell me more about this leisure time? Of course. Since my kids and wife do not have to work in the factories that most working class families do, they have much more time to express their creativity and be physically active. The painting of Franklin Park, Boston by Morris Pendlegast shows this very well with many middle class women and children walking and running around the park. This has been eye-opening. Thanks, Mr. Engineer. Thanks for joining us today. Next up, Chapter 20. Whee!